This probably doesn't look like your home or any typical home. The architecture is a little different. The roof is not slanted and has no shingles nor small brick chimney. The building itself is far larger than your home or mine. There are many more windows and doors and floors. Nevertheless, for nine months of the year, this is the home of 900 to 1,200 boys at Iowa State University. It is Wallace Wilson, a unit of the Towers Residence Association. Like any home, Wallace Wilson needs someone to scrub the floors, vacuum the carpets, wash the windows, and clean out the sinks. And like any home, Wallace Wilson needs someone to feed those hungry boys. Most of us, too, must scrub floors, vacuum the carpets, and wash the windows. But we spend the majority of our day in the kitchen, planning and preparing three meals a day for our family of four or six, or maybe even 10 or 11. We shop for groceries, set the table before the meal, and clean up our kitchen after one. We make sure the right condiments are out at each meal. And if you're like me, you get tired of that kitchen work sometimes, even if you're only feeding three or four or 10 or 11. Today, I hope to make our kitchen work seem lighter. Our preparation for a meal starts with a sack or two of groceries. At Wallace Wilson, the foodstuffs come by the truckloads and are put on that ramp. You and I get up early to get breakfast for our families. These cooks are in the kitchen at five o'clock each morning. Today, they used 90 dozen eggs and 30 pounds of bacon. It took nine to 12 pounds of oats for the oatmeal, and this is about what it takes no matter what hot cereal is used. And those boys of theirs ate between 50 and 55 dozen rolls or donuts. They started on lunch now. Today, it's hamburgers and a bun. But on a macaroni day, it would take 80 pounds of noodles and 35 gallons of milk. Stew takes 180 pounds of meat, 50 pounds of carrots, one case of celery, and 25 pounds of onions. Two winter-type dishes are chili and chicken and noodles. Chili takes three cases of kidney beans, three cases of tomatoes, and 180 pounds of meat. Chicken and noodles calls for four cases of chicken, 20 gallons of water, and four jars of chicken base. Almost all the food is kept hot in thermotainers at the front of each serving line. The temperature can be regulated according to the type of food. Although soup is a well-liked addition to many meals, often, instead, there is a vegetable. The amount for this varies. For example, 160 pounds of peas is enough, but it takes 200 pounds of corn. Some vegetables, as any woman knows, are not eaten as quickly as others. One of the first chores these ladies do before beginning their work is to set up the trays for the salads. Even this varies from meal to meal and from day to day. Today, they're using saucers for orange slices. Another time, it might be large bowls. For applesauce, they'd use small bowls. To make that salad, they would need 24 number 10 cans of applesauce, plus any spices they might add, like cinnamon. At times, the applesauce is heated for a special taste. Helen, June, and Mary often make jello and fruit cocktail. It takes four gallons of jello, 16 gallons of water, and 12 number 10 cans of fruit cocktail. The jello is usually garnished with endive or lettuce. That dish would feed about 800. For a lettuce salad in a large bowl, they need two cases of lettuce. Dressings offered vary from blue cheese to French to creamy Italian to Thousand Island, and usually there are three or four kinds to choose from. When they have a tomato plate, it takes more than six cases or more than 360 tomatoes. Sometimes the boys are served pineapple slices topped with a scoop of cool sherbet or cottage cheese. The salad ladies use 16 number 10 cans of pineapple on those days. When sliced peaches are on the menu, the ladies open about 26 number 10 cans. The bakery department prides itself on its delicious and varied desserts. To make today's pie crust, Donna and Virginia needed 45 pounds of flour, 30 pounds of shortening, 
one and a half gallons of water and one and a half cups of salt. The filling took 15 gallons of milk, 15 cups of cornstarch, 22 cups of flour, three and three quarters gallons of sugar, 10 tablespoons of salt, 30 cups of eggs, and two cups of vanilla. A pumpkin pie filling calls for 160 eggs, 10 number 10 cans of pumpkin, 30 pounds of flour, eight and a quarter gallons of evaporated milk, plus a cup or so of ginger, cloves, and cinnamon. Rolls, a kind of special treat, need two gallons of water, two pounds of yeast, 44 eggs, 44 pounds of roll mix, and three quarts of water. Chocolate cake is another popular dessert. Donna and Virginia need 11 pounds of shortening, 28 pounds of sugar, 128 eggs, 16 cups of water, two gallons of milk, about 21 tablespoons of vanilla, 16 tablespoons each of baking soda, salt, and powder, 21 pounds of cake flour, and the chocolate. The bakery ladies use a wide variety of equipment. This mixer, which Virginia hooks up, can run at several speeds. They also have an oven with rotating shelves, a freezer and a cooler for storage, and large kettles like the one Jane used for her tomato soup. For sack lunches, which students get if they have a class at mealtime, Donna and Virginia often make chocolate chip cookies. They use 20 pounds of shortening, 20 cups of brown sugar, 20 pounds of white sugar, 80 eggs, about 12 tablespoons each of salt and soda, more than 30 pounds of flour, 30 pounds of chocolate chips, two gallons plus of nuts, and water, vanilla, and butternut chips. Margaret doesn't get in on food preparation, except on the Sundays she works. Her job is to take care of the main dining room, the two party rooms, and the training room for the Iowa State athletes. She washes 85 tables and about 560 chairs each day, once after breakfast and once after lunch. It takes her about an hour or so each time. She also fills sugar, salt, and pepper shakers and has them run through the dish machine when they need cleaning. In addition, she puts catsup or mustard bottles or steak sauce on each table when the menu calls for them. And she almost always puts a large pan of catsup, mustard, and pickle relish on a center table in the dining room, no matter what is on the menu. Her job is fairly routine, unless she finds a sugar shaker which has been turned upside down and the lid placed on the top to make it look normal. If she's not careful, she'll spill sugar all over the table when she lifts the shaker up. Sometimes she'll spot a glass stuck to the bottom of the table with a butter patty, and she'll have to catch it before it falls. While Margaret cleans up the dining hall, Ox finishes up the dishes which were left from the previous meal. During mealtime, the dish machine line is manned primarily by student help. Cups, glasses, plates, saucers, large and small bowls, silverware and trays are sorted as they come through on the conveyor belt. Although Ox loads and unloads the machine himself here, at busy times, several sort, several load the machine, and several unload. From conveyor belt to dish machine to storage rack takes only a few seconds, and the dishes are scalded and dried and ready to go at the next meal. The dish machine is not the only remarkable piece of equipment at Wallace Wilson. This is a steamer used for many of the vegetables, which are fixed. The quantity of serving utensils in itself is something to see. These spoons are used to serve vegetables on the line. Scoops are used not only to dish sherbet and ice cream, but for mashed potatoes, made right hamburgers, and potato salad. Ladles in the smaller size, like the one Marilyn finds, are used to serve catsup, mustard, and relishes on the center table in the main dining hall. 
And of course, this kitchen has its shelves of pots and pans, and pitchers, measuring cups, and measuring gallons, two-inch pans, four-inch pans, cereal containers, strainers. After seeing all this, doesn't your day seem brighter? Recently, Dr. Matty Musup uh, made a presentation sponsored by the Arab Student Organization and the Iowa State University Lecture Committee. His presentation was entitled, The Arab-Israeli uh, Conflict. He is professor of history at uh, Gannon College in Erie, Pennsylvania. He's had uh, quite a bit of experience uh, with, uh, I think, the United Nations, with various positions prior to your uh, taking the position as professor of history at Gannon. Uh, would you like to review that just a little bit before we go into the, some of these uh, topics? Uh, actually, uh, I was associated with the United States Embassy in Baghdad for five years, and then I uh, received a United Nations scholarship to study at the University of Wales for one year, I believe, 1953-54. Uh, before I came to the United States. Well, let's, uh, since we have only a limited amount of time, uh, go on to some of the problems that uh, are part of our everyday living, uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict. Um, where do we go from here to perhaps establish some kind of, uh, I would call, positive equilibrium for the yeah. people of the Middle East being able to live together peacefully? Uh, I think that uh, peace is possible uh, since uh, both uh, the Jews and the Arabs are Semitic people, culturally I mean, uh, because Semitic actually means, uh, it's, it's a cultural term. As long as both have uh, uh, almost same background and same culture, I shouldn't uh, see why they couldn't get together and live uh, in peace as Semitic people, not as uh, Arabs and Western uh, people or uh, Europeans, as the Israelis love to call themselves. Uh, I think, Dorcas, the, uh, the, 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 the core of the problem is that uh, the Zionists in Israel uh, think of Israel as an exclusively Jewish state where non-Jew has no place. So once you uh, base uh, a state on theocracy or uh, racism or uh, chauvinism, uh, this uh, exclude, uh, naturally exclude all the other people. And, and uh, there will be no peace in the Middle East as long as uh, Israel pursues its uh, Zionist philosophy. So de-Zionization of Israel is the answer. Um, what I mean here is that, uh, the, uh, that Israel should uh, resign to the fact that it's only a, uh, uh, a Middle Eastern state with a Middle Eastern culture and not as a, uh, a European state with Western culture uh, in which, you know, the Arabs are only second-class citizens. Now, this implies then that the culture that has been established there is the Zionist culture is not of the original uh, Zionist flavor, but as you say, of the Western flavor, which makes it incompatible at the present time with the uh, Middle East culture. Uh, Dorcas, may I just uh, comment on one thing? You, you mentioned uh, Zionist culture. Actually, Zionism is not a culture. It's a political movement uh, which emerged in the 19th century among the uh, Jewish uh, Eastern European intelligentsia uh, to solve the so-called Jewish problem in Eastern Europe. And uh, you realize, of course, that uh, many Jews lived in the ghettos of of Russia, they were persecuted by the Russians because they wouldn't uh, become assimilated in the Russian society. And hence is the pogroms of 1881, 1882. Uh, there was some persecution over there and uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, Jewish intelligentsia thought that 
the uh, persecution problem, which they called anti-Semitism, cannot be solved unless these Jews will have a, stout, a state of their own. And, uh, well, they wanted uh, Palestine uh, because of alleged you know, historical uh, association with the land. But uh, some of them even did not think of, uh, of Palestine, like uh, Dr. Leo Pinska. Uh, he did not uh, care whether it is Palestine or anywhere else, as long as he could, uh, the Jews could uh, establish a state in which to get rid of these uh, Gentile persecution. So it's a, it's, a, it's a political national movement. Now, in uh, our present century, and with the uh, uh, certainly interrelated uh, cultures throughout the world becoming more important uh, for survival for all, uh, again, how do we solve this? Well, by establishing goodwill, as the good Americans did to the Arabs in the 19th century. Dorcas, not many Americans know that the cultural, the Arab cultural renaissance, or I call it renaissance, or awakening in the Middle East was motivated by, purely by American people. Those good people, those good missionaries who went to the Middle East, uh, established schools and hospitals, uh, created a great deal of goodwill among the Arabs. The result of their labor was the American University of Beirut, the uh, American University of Cairo, Robert College in Istanbul, and many, many uh, uh, American schools. My sister, right now, is a teacher in Baghdad in the American School for Girls. Now, America has had strong you know, cultural relations with the, with the Arab world. It has established uh, goodwill among the Arabs. I don't see why uh, America shouldn't, you know, uh, reestablish its cultural relations with the Arabs and help them without cutting its relation with Israel. As I mentioned uh, to you on your radio uh, show, that uh, uh, the Arabs really are not saying that uh, the United States should turn its back you know, to Israel and favor the Arabs. The Arabs are saying that the United States should not completely identify itself with Israel and favors Israel at the expense of the Arabs. That is injustice. Now, so you think the climate is such that uh, overtures by the United States to uh, give uh, the help that is needed uh, would be accepted? Uh, yes, it would. I think the first step right now for the United States to do or to take is to es establish, to reestablish its relations with Egypt. Because I am positive that there's no one in the Middle East today and among all of the Arab leaders who aspires to reestablish relations with the United States uh, like Nasser. President Nasser really wants to establish uh, relations with the United States. But as I told you before, that uh, the, the, the makers of uh, uh, foreign policy in Washington are pressured too much by pressure groups here, mainly Jewish group, Jewish pressure group. And, uh, in that sense, uh, they cannot really come up with any viable uh, uh, foreign policy which would uh, establish good will with the Arab states. And I wish we had longer, but we do not. All right. I'm sorry. No. Our guest is Dr. Matty Musa, who is a professor of history at Gannon College in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania. He made a presentation entitled The Arab-Israeli Conflict. Uh, for the audience at Iowa State, this was sponsored by the Arab Student Organization and the Iowa State University Lecture Committee. And thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Dorcas.